Well, happy July 4th weekend to all of you. We are grateful that you have chosen to spend a part of your weekend with us here at Church of the Palms, and we hope that you will be able to have, as you already have, perhaps the chance to celebrate the freedom that we get to do such things such as worship our God. We uh, are grateful for all the many ways by which we are continuing in our ministry here at Church of the Palms throughout these days of uh, spikes and uh, graphs and all those things that uh, keep us concerned about the conditions in which we live. Our food pantry continues to go strong and we're still in need of volunteers. We are grateful for the response we received this week, but each week continues with its needs. So we hope that you will uh, sign up on our website. Just go to the home page, hit the serve button. You'll find the registration form there and sign up and help us in and all the different ways that you can support us in that ministry. Our Palms Preschool continues to to meet and we're grateful for the 70 children or so that are there as a part of that ministry. Our Samaritan Counseling Center continues strong and Day of Hope continues to be uh, prepared for and we will be looking forward to July 18th when we have the chance to serve so many uh, children in our community. We encourage you to join us for our sermon feedback, which is on Monday morning at 10 o'clock, a chance for you to get online with us. You can register again on our website and uh, have a conversation with the preacher of the day uh, to think more about what the ramifications are for our preaching and our sermons and the text that we spend our time focusing on. And then on Fridays at noon, we have a wonderful discussion on the Gospel of Mark reading. So the, for the course of the week, we had a wonderful discussion today. Uh, today we're pre-recording, of course, our worship for uh, Sunday broadcast, but we uh, look forward to having others join us in those discussions as well. And then also we look ahead to, the, uh, to Monday, July the 20th at six o'clock where we'll have a discussion on the book Strength to Love by Martin Luther King as we again seek to understand the ways by which we are called to respond to the racial concerns that we experience in our community. We uh, are gonna be receiving communion today, so we invite you to uh, set aside some communion elements and be prepared as we come to that time in our service when we receive uh, the great gifts of God during our sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So we hope that you will uh, join us for that as well. To whom much is given and much is required is a pastor, I'm not sure I've ever understood those words more than even now. Much is required of us these days, especially in this time of COVID-19. And there's no greater joy than we've had than to live into that great call upon our lives. So as I mentioned, all of our ministries are going strong. We are uh, reaching out to 200 families a day through our food pantry, pastoral care is being provided, 50 callers are reaching out to 50 homes as much as once a week. So much has been given to us and much is being required and we hope that you will keep that in mind as we wonder together about how God is calling us to support this ministry as we seek to support our community in these days and weeks to come. You see the opportunities on your screen and we hope that you will uh, give generously as we seek to respond to our community with the love of Jesus Christ. Now let's continue our worship.
Oh 
as we go to God in prayer, knowing that there's nothing that God can't do, we uh, remind you that if you have any prayer requests that you would like to share with us, to send them to Lori Haas at lhaas at churchofthepalms.org. And uh, while mentioning her, she's not, been, she's not here today. She wasn't here last week. She's been out of town both days. And uh, we promise you she will be back uh, next week to lead us in worship. As we go to God in prayer, we keep in mind, especially on this weekend, our nation, and our nation is challenged by many different things, and it's always been challenged in one form or another, but today, perhaps especially, we need to offer prayers to God that God might uh, uh, guide us as we seek to be uh, a more perfect union. So to that end, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we hear those words, America the beautiful, oh, beautiful for spacious skies, we do give you thanks that we get to live in this wonderful country in which we have the freedom to be able to gather and to worship and to proclaim what it is that we believe. We thank you, O oh God, that you have created the world in freedom and that you have given us all the freedom by which to carry out our lives. And so we pray especially, O oh Lord, for the movement of your Holy Spirit, that as we seek to be neighbor in this nation of ours, that we might understand how it is that we can be agents of your love and of your grace. There is so much that can pull us apart, so much that can put strain upon our relationships and upon our fellow citizens. And we ask, O oh God, in this time of pandemic and this time of racial strife, that you will give us a deeper calling so that we may become more neighbor to those that are near us and even to those who are far away. Help us to find ways to walk in other people's shoes that we may discover more of how we can support each other to be your people and to be one before your throne of grace. Lord, we lift to you those who are struggling with a variety of challenges, whether it's uh, the illnesses that surround us with COVID-19 or whether it is through uh, strained relationships or whether it's through illness. And we pray especially again today for Will Hedgepeth as he continues to be uh, fighting this battle with cancer, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you will surround him continually with those he loves. And we pray for others that we may not know that are struggling and lift them to you and ask, O oh God, that they may know of your peace and of your presence and of the love of those that surround them with prayers. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to respond to your call to love God and love neighbor and pray that we may feel the power of your Holy Spirit to do that very thing. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now I'd like to invite Olivia Mason, a senior coming up at Venice High School to read the scripture for us today. Today's lesson comes from Luke chapter seven, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, and one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more, Simon answered. I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the, one, 
but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Olivia. Well, we continue on in our series on the spiritual disciplines, and you may recall that we've taken a look at a few so far over the course of this summer, uh, prayer and solitude and the discipline of study and the discipline of fasting we looked at last week. And today we're taking a look at the spiritual discipline of submission. Submission, a word that maybe is not as appealing to us as other uh, spiritual disciplines, but today we're going to explore this discipline and wonder about what God might be calling us to in this particular time when it comes to submitting our lives before something else. So to that end, let us pray. By your grace, O Lord, and through your mercy, we pray that you will allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, where we pray this in his name, amen. One of the great rites of passage in American adolescence is the moment when you get handed your first set of keys to the car. When you're, when you're given the chance to sit in the driver's seat and put your hands on the steering wheel. This, this may be a universal thing, I don't know, but, but there comes this time for millions and millions of youth when they get handed the keys and given the freedom to take the family car into their own hands. I remember three distinct moments in my middle teen years when I was handed three separate and distinct sets of keys to the car. The first set of keys I received were my father's keys, which he handed to me when only I had a permit to drive, which means I had to have an adult in the car. He entrusted me with the responsibility, I'm sure only after I begged for it, to drive the family car with the family in it on Christmas Day to grandma and grandpa's house two states over. I, I thought I was the bee's knees taking my place behind the wheel with all of six hours of driver's ed in my system. I was now given the freedom to pilot our family down Interstate 55 through Illinois on the way to Kansas City. No problemo. Until about an hour later when due to my inexperience, I lost control of the car hit a telephone pole, totaled the car, put my mother in the hospital for a couple of days with some broken bones. That was how I handled the responsibility that came with my being handed that first set of keys. The second set of keys came two days later when in my hosp mother's hospital room, we were opening the mashed and crinkled Christmas gifts we had managed to pry from the mangled trunk of the car that I had just totaled, gifts my mother had pre-wrapped for us to open once we got to grandma and grandpa's house, where we of course would never get to go, thanks to me, I couldn't figure out what this little package was at the bottom of my stocking until I opened it, and sure enough, there they were, the keys to the car I had just sent to an early junkyard grave. That's the last set of keys you're going to get, my father said in jest. I thank God we had the kind of family that could see the humor in life's little ironies. The third set of keys were the keys my father gave me a few months later to the new car he had had to purchase in the wake of my rookie wreck. He handed this new set to me, my very own set, after I had nervously passed my driver's test, and as he handed them to me and I reluctantly received them, he graciously said, you're gonna be fine. You're going to be fine. I suppose that's what loving parents do. They give, they give you another chance. 
It's not the first time I've told that story to some of you. It's obviously a life-altering experience, maybe even a Damascus Road experience for me. I imagine it was because of at least three things that came together for me in that season of misfortune. And the three experiences were these. The, the thrilling feel of freedom, followed by the heavy burden of responsibility, and then followed by the transformative surprise of grace. The thrill of freedom that came with being handed those keys, first of all, the heavy burden of responsibility, perceived or unperceived, that comes with getting behind the wheel, and the transformative surprise of grace when you're given a new set of keys. I suppose a lot of life has a good bit to do with how you hold on to those three things. The thrill of freedom, the burden of responsibility, and the surprise of grace. So in our lesson today, Jesus gets invited to dinner. He's invited to dinner by a Pharisee named Simon. And, and who should follow in right behind Jesus but a woman, a, a woman whom Luke describes as a woman from the sin city, a sinner. Now, we can't be sure exactly what Luke is saying here, but most believe that she could have been a prostitute. So, so at dinner, Jesus is sitting in between a Pharisee, a holier-than-thou Pharisee, and a prostitute, a woman whose misfortunate choices are out there for everyone to see. Now, these two table mates of Jesus are free to do with this moment whatever they please, and Jesus is just as free as well. So the woman exercises her freedom in that moment by acting upon a previous and surprising grace. She has received earlier, we can imagine, words of absolution from Jesus, and now with that freedom, she takes on the joyful burden of worshiping and adoring the source of that freedom. She weeps tears of joy, she kisses Jesus' feet, she anoints Jesus with her greatest treasure, sweet and expensive oil, with surprising grace comes this thrill of freedom, and with the thrill of freedom comes this responsibility to turn the joy of her life and channeling it into an act of submission before Jesus. Now the Pharisee, on the other hand, when he observes the presence of this morally suspicious person, exercises the freedom given to him, he thinks, by the law, by condemning not only the woman, but the rabbi Jesus who led her in to begin with. His allegiance is to the law. His responsibility, he thinks, is to call fouls. And if there's any grace, he's going to hold on to it for himself. And then Jesus, on the other hand, exercises his freedom, his license, to look at this woman with a righteousness even holier than the Pharisees, possessing even the right to inflict upon her the condemnation of divine judgment, but with freedom, Jesus bathes her further with grace and takes up the responsibility of advocating for her in the face of Simon's unsparing judgment. Three people, inherently free to do whatever they want. One makes it his responsibility to judge, the other makes it her responsibility to worship and submit, and the other makes it his responsibility to forgive, advocate, and restore. Three people who in their freedom are driven by three internal sets of principles about what they think life is all about. It's the human condition. We are, we are free to respond. It's a free world to life circumstances in whatever way we choose. To be persons is to be shaped, though, by a set of ideas about what we think the world is really all about. And we exercise our freedom by expressing those ideas and principles. The Pharisee, shaped by the the law judges. The woman, shaped by grace, worships. And Jesus, the incarnate God, forgives, advocates, and restores. All three driven by different principles to which they had submitted. 
Which takes us, I suppose, to our discipline of the week, which as I said earlier, is submission. Because you see, with the gift of freedom comes the decision over what will be the set of ideas to which we will submit ourselves. With the gift of freedom comes the choice of who or what you will submit yourself to. We often think that freedom means the absence of submission, but the truth is we submit ourselves to some idea or principles and we consciously or unconsciously obey those. With freedom comes the choice of what we're gonna commit ourselves to, what we're gonna submit ourselves to, to our own whims, our own pocketbooks, our own prejudices, our own politics, our own values, our own people, our own party, our own, our own, our own. Or we will submit ourselves to some greater authority an authority beyond ourselves. I guess it started all the way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, given the freedom of the garden to do with it whatever they please. And oh, oh, by the way, God says, just stay away from that tree over there. Do whatever you want, but best not touch that tree. But even so, you're free even to do that. With freedom comes this choice over to whom you will submit. And the first man and the first woman submit to their own whims. And it has been downhill ever since. When a kid gets handed the keys, with those keys, of course, comes the choice of what she will submit herself to, the rules of the road, the whims of her friends, the thrill of reckless speed, the speed limit signs, the red, yellow, green of traffic signals, the well-being of other drivers, the crossing ped pedestrians. What will be the operating influence? This is the hardest form of exercise, the exercise of our freedom. Great consequences flow from the choices we make as to what principles we will submit ourselves to. Which of course is the July 4th question. The question that every American is led to ask in our Declaration of Independence and in our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, what then will we do with our freedom? What responsibility are we willing to take on? What, what person or thing are we willing to submit ourselves to? What, what choices will I make in exercising my freedom? What religion will I choose to follow? When I freely take my place at Jesus' table, what responsibility from there will I bear? And I suppose we already have the answer to that question every time we pledge allegiance to the flag. Ever since kindergarten, I have, I have pledged allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. With this freedom I have been given, symbolized by the flag, I pledge liberty and justice for all. What to do with our freedom? What responsibility do we bear with our freedom? To pursue liberty and justice for all. It's as clear as the nose on our faces. It's been the very thing our nation has aspired to do, albeit with terrible detours along the way. It's been the very thing we have sought to do from the moment when Thomas Jefferson set his pen to paper and wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Jefferson wrote that as a slaveholder, so from the very beginning we've been dealing with the tragic ironies and hypocrisies of this aspiration. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, the pledge wraps it in one phrase, with liberty and justice for all. That with freedom 
comes the pursuit of liberty and justice for all, that, that all might not be enslaved by our preconceived notions, our opinions, our whims, our limited experience, but that the experiment of America is how to make sure all have a fair shot, that we all get the same opportunity, that we all get treated in the same way, that we cannot fully celebrate our freedom until all can fully celebrate their freedom. What a great responsibility for you and I to bear, to be the instruments of grace in this hard world, to do whatever I need to do to make sure that my brother and sister are given a chance to advocate for the ones who others are want to put in their place. Liberty for all means justice for all, and justice for all, which means in Jesus' book, grace for all, to take the keys from Jesus and to pass them on to let others take the wheel themselves. It makes me think of the encounter John Lewis had with Elwin Wilson. Maybe you remember this story. U.S. Representative John Lewis, African-American, long before he was a congressman, was an activist for civil rights and was a freedom rider who exercised his freedom by partnering with a white friend to ride a bus into the deep south. And at a bus stop along the way, they got out of the bus and were met by an angry white mob and were beaten for daring to cross the legal segregation line. Elwin Wilson was the chief beater who left John Lewis and his friend bloody and broken. Fast forward 50 years when it dawns on Elwin Wilson that the man he had beaten 50 years before had become a U.S. congressperson and that the world had changed and that he had been so, so wrong so long ago. Ah, that was 50 years ago. Why should we worry about 50 years ago? That's ancient history, isn't it? No, with freedom comes responsibility. So the former segregationist shows up in con the congressman's office and begs John Lewis's forgiveness, begs for grace, begs for another chance. And the victim, the bearer of wounds from long ago, what will he do with his freedom? Well, with freedom comes responsibility. So what do you do when you're John Lewis with these wounds of 50 years? You forgive, you reconcile, you build the bridge. And for the remaining days of Elwin Wilson's life, he joined John Lewis in jointly crying out for justice, with liberty and justice for all. Don't you wonder if sometimes when big things happen at the same time that they, they sort of beg a bigger question? And don't you wonder if the, the pandemic of COVID and the eruption of racial tension, if they don't come to us at the same time, if only to beg us to ask a bigger question. Maybe it's the question about the justice of Jesus. Th that should it be the health of my neighbor or the racist realities faced by my black friends that with my liberty, comes the responsibility for my neighbor. That, that instead of sitting back and coming up with all the reasons for why these things are, are the way they are, that the first move, the first move is grace. The first responsibility is grace. The first burden we bear from the freedom we've been given is liberty and justice for all to listen to the cry of the caged bird and to find the keys to unlock the door. Maybe that's the choice we get even today with this table. The body broken, the blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus bears this responsibility of freedom and sacrifices his life for us, for our sins. 
my sins, your sins, the world's sins. Can we call this the freedom table? But then the question that follows is, what are we gonna do with this freedom? What submission will we make and to which master? And what pledge of allegiance will we claim? With liberty and justice for all? The hardest form of exercise is the exercise of our freedom. Friends, we are freely invited to come to this table. Jesus doesn't ask anything of us, but that we just simply come and that we receive his grace and his mercy, that we are freed from the burden of our sin, free then to take on the new burden of responsibility. So friends, you are invited to come here and know that Christ meets you wherever you are and has this great desire to take you to somewhere you need to be, perhaps most of all into the life of a neighbor so that your neighbor, near or far, would know of God's grace and God's love through you. Hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the same night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. When you drink of this, remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes again. And he will come again. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you meet us where we are. And we pray, O oh God, that we may pledge a new allegiance to you, that we may submit our lives to your way, your truth, your life, that we may follow you wherever you wish to take us, especially into the lives of those who may not know of your grace and love, or those that may not have experienced true justice, for those maybe who have experienced the devastation of racism, for those who are worried about COVID-19. Allow us, O oh Lord, to be the people we need to be that we may administer grace and not judgment and that we may gather up all your people that they may join us at table and know of your love and mercy. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We invite you to receive the bread and the cup at your homes and that in doing so, you may know of God's peace and may be filled with these heavenly gifts that this food may nourish you to be the people that God wishes you to be. Let us now receive the bread and cup. Broken stand overwhelmed by the way. Sin, Jesus is calling. 
Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. We'll come to the altar. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is wrong with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Rain your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life was born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar and the Father's arms are
Let us pray. Lord, you were free to judge us with your righteousness. And if that had been the case, O oh Lord, none of us could stand. But instead, you chose to use your freedom to judge us with grace, to give us another set of keys, to give to us the responsibility of living in freedom and in grace, that we may see all our neighbors as those who deserve most of all our love and our mercy and our grace. So Lord, continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to bear this responsibility that we may be your people in the world. And the world may see the light of Christ through us and that all will be brought together again by your mercy and by your grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.